Okay, so um, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and lecture here. Uh, should be fun. Okay, so um, broadly speaking, the topic I'm going to talk about is how to use experiments beyond the traditional collider program, um, which at the moment is represented strongly by the LHC, to look for physics beyond the standard model. So, I mean, you're sure you've heard already in various lectures the reasons why we think such physics beyond the standard model must be out there. We have, just to go over it very briefly, we have dark matter, which you had an introduction to in the last lecture. We've got a load of stuff out there which pretty much can't be any of the normal matter that we know about, but nevertheless makes up a large fraction of the energy in the universe. We've also got various problems with the standard model. We've got tuning problems of various kinds, which I expect you'll hear about in the Beyond Standard Model lectures. For example, the electroweak hierarchy problem. The strong CP problem. And also, various issues in cosmology. Even though we understand how the universe works close by fairly well, modulo dark matter, there are features of the universe on very large scales and at very early times. The need to create perturbations through something like inflation, the need to create the observed matter-antimatter asymmetry through barrier genesis, that we can't make work just with the physics we know about. And then, somewhat beyond all that, there's the question of how to include gravity in a theory in a self-consistent manner that works up to all energy scales. So, there are various reasons we know, well, that something else other than just the standard model should be out there. Okay, but what form could that take? So, if we plot things out on sort of an extremely rough graph, so this is mass. And then things like the LHC Collider program are pretty, are for the most part, searching for things around the electroweak scale with this axis is going to be coupling, say, to the standard model, with decent sized couplings to the standard model. Somewhere around here, with the standard model mass matter sitting around there. And this is certainly a well-motivated place to look by considerations such as various models of dark matter, issues of the electroweak hierarchy problem, various models of baryogenesis, things like that. But in many models of new physics, there can also be new stuff lurking at very different places. For example, there can be new physics at much higher mass scales. For example, uh, unified theories, so what are called grand unified theories, explanations for neutrino masses, other things sitting up at energy scales significantly beyond what the LHC has access to. So you can't try and find them just by banging stuff together and looking for the new stuff to be produced. Similarly, though we've explored pretty well normal energy scales, it's always possible that there's new stuff around that's light, but it's just weakly coupled enough to us that it's very hard to see. We didn't see neutrinos for a very long time, even though their masses are very small. It's very easy in some sense to produce them. It's just very hard to detect them. And there's lots of theories of beyond standard model physics where you also have things down here. For example, the QCD axion solution to the strong CP problem. You get naturally light particles there. Sorry, just to make sure. I should probably write bigger, shouldn't I? Can people see these words? OK, that's a good start. There are various models in which there are extra forces arising from extra dimensions, various things like that. And so generically, as well as the collider problem looking up here, there's a strong motivation to look both down here at low masses and weak couplings and up here at much larger mass scales and see whether there's any observational evidence we can get. So 
Yeah, basically, my lectures will be talking about these two parts. Today, we'll mostly be looking at this regime, so large masses uh, above collider energy scales. The rest of the lectures will talk a bit more about looking for stuff which is light but very weakly coupled. Okay, so how can we try and look for something if it's so heavy that even our highest energy colliders can't actually produce it? So at the LHC, you're hoping to bang particles together and actually produce new supersymmetric particles or whatever, which will then decay, and you can see the decay products and what have you. Here, we, won't ha we don't have that option. What they will do is that if we have um, some new stuff in addition to the standard model, then at low energy scales, we've got the standard model Lagrangian, which is all of the usual terms up to dimension four. So kinetic terms plus our Yukawa terms. And these are all things which are re part of the renormalizable theory. If we had extra states of high energies, then their effect in low energy experiments can generally be summarized by writing down some higher dimensional operators. So operators which are suppressed by some higher energy scale, say, and are still made up of standard model fields because those are the things that we're actually doing the experiments with, and so on. And so in order not to have seen these yet, this new scale, so this is a scale of whatever new physics is coming in, with couplings, et cetera, this should generally be significantly larger than the scales we've probed. So electroweak scale, et cetera. Now, if you just write down some random operator like that, um, okay, looking for it's gonna be kind of hard, you want some systematic way of going about it. And a good systematic way of, well, one way to start is asking what can't happen in the standard model but could happen if we added extra stuff in. So looking for things where you know that you're not going to get it if it's just the stuff we know about. It has to be new stuff in order to make it happen. And the first thing I'll talk about like that is nucleon decay. Okay, so in the standard model, we have baryon number, which is, so each quark carries baryon number, so baryon number of each quark is one third, baryon number of each antiquark is minus a third, so protons and neutrons have baryon number one, and antiprotons and antineutrons, baryon number minus one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so in the dimension four standard model Lagrangian, baryon number is an accidental symmetry. We just look at all the terms and we find that we've got quark, anti-quark, so that's minus one, minus a third plus a third, doesn't violate baryon number. These ones again, uh, quark, anti-quark, anti-quark, doesn't violate baryon number. If you want to get terms which are violating baryon number, you're gonna have to write down things like three quarks to keep uh, SU3 color invariants, and those just automatically turn out to have higher dimension. So we have the chance that in the standard model we're not going to get violation occurring, and in particular that means that if baryon number is a good symmetry, then the lightest B equals one state which is the proton, is stable. Baryon number conserved. Which is good, because we don't see protons decaying. Baryons which are heavier, such as a neutron, can certainly decay. You can get a neutron decaying into a proton, uh, electron, neutrino, but the proton can't decay then. A quick aside, it isn't actually true that, strictly true, that in the standard model, even at renormalizable level, uh, baryon number is strictly conserved. Though all of the terms in the Grangian um, don't violate it, it's actually anomalous. So if you write down triangle diagrams, 
with W bosons and hypercharged bosons, then you find out that uh, the baryon number current is violated where, so this is the number of generations because you have all the different generations going around in these things and then you get some expression which involves uh, gauge field strengths. So, and if you work out the consequences of this, then it turns out that non-perturbative processes called uh, electroweak sphalerons can actually give you violation of baryon number from this anomaly. However, because of this number of generations thing in here, all of these baryon number violating processes occurs with delta B equals three times some integer. You can't get, uh, yes. Oh yes, absolutely, sure. Uh, which bit in particular? Okay, let's just, this part is not particular, this part is somewhat detailed, but uh, just uh, put it out there. So this is just writing out the uh, non-conservation of this due to the Chiron anomaly. So we have the gauge field terms here. But the point is that once you do all of this, so you, you need to be careful about normalization and everything, which is much more detail than going to here. But once you've done all of that, you find that because of the number of generations part in here, you have always, you've got to do up, ch charm, top, or whatever, if you're going around in the circle, then you can only violate baryon number by multiples of three units through these. So even though we have baryon number violation, we can't violate baryon number by one. We can't say go from a proton, which is baryon number one, to some set of lighter standard model things with baryon number zero. So even taking this into account, we are safe in the standard model. Protons shouldn't decay. However, if we go to higher dimensional operators, then, well, if we just naively write down something like this, then, well, okay, baryon number may not be conserved. But this was very schematic. Can we actually get an operator that will do this. So let's uh, try writing one down. So we've got, this is just an exercise to illustrate how you go about it. So in the standard model, we've got hypercharges for our various things. We've got that our Q has hypercharge minus six. We've got our up and down hypercharges. Uh, two -third. This is taking a particular convention, but as long as we take a consistent convention, everything is okay. We've got our lepton, multiplet, minus a half, and we've got our right hand to the electron, minus one. Okay, so we want to try and put together some set of all these things, which preserves all the standard model uh, gauge symmetries. We don't want to violate those. Uh, violating a gauge symmetry is bad. Violating some accidental symmetry is naively fine. Okay, so let's take combinations of the SU2 singlets to make things simple. So we're going to want three quarks, such that the SU3 indices work out. So uh, let's take, say, our down, up, and up. This one has minus a third hypercharge. This one has plus two thirds. This one has plus two thirds. So this is plus one overall. So we see that if we stick in a right-handed electron, minus one, we get no hypercharge overall. So this expression would be invariant under, under hypercharge. So what it's telling us is that we can write down some expression of the form, this is a dimension six thing, so the term in Lagrangian should be dimension four. It's suppressed by some mass scale squared. So then we take this, and this is a valid term in the uh, Lagrangian which will be there with appropriate kinds of new physics, which will give us baryon number violation. So we have three, we have baryon number one here, zero here. Okay, so, and just very directly, 
this kind of thing will allow us to take protons and cause them to decay. So just writing that out, we've got a proton which is made of up, up, and down. If we have some four core cooperator here, so up, up, and now we're going to have a positron and an anti-down. Then we started with a proton, and now we've got a positron, and this is going to be part of a pi zero. If we write out, you get the other part of the pi zero, we can take up, down, up, this part, go like that. So, this kind of operator will give us the ability for the proton to decay to a positron and a pi zero. And the pi zero will then decay to two gammas. Okay, so this is interesting, and it's also, uh, of course, somewhat dangerous, because we don't see protons decaying yet. It's certainly in normal life. So it had better be that this process is very suppressed. Or to turn it around, because uh, we don't really see protons decaying, we can put strong constraints on the kind of physics that can lead to such things. So what are the kind of experimental limits on how much protons can decay? So the best come from uh, things which you use for neutrino detectors. So these are giant tanks of effectively water where the, line, the walls are lined with lots and lots of sensors looking for high energy photons. When a neutrino comes in, it'll come in and bang into something, create high energy photons, which you'll see. But similarly, for proton decays, it will create high energy photons from the positron and from the pi zero, which will then go out to the walls and we can see those. So what kind of constraints can we get from this? Oh yeah, sorry. No, go for it. Yes. Um, okay, I'm not quite sure I know, quite know what you mean, mean there, but it's certainly the case that if you have these kind of operators, then you can also get decay of neutrons through them. In free space, neutrons decay much faster through the weak interactions, but like you said, in a bound state, they don't. So in, the, in a nucleus, you could get neutrons in the nucleus decaying through this kind of thing in exactly the same kind of way. So I'm just saying proton decay because that's the sort of what happens in free space. But in nucleus, certainly you can get effectively neutron decay through exactly the same kind of thing. Uh, was that was there any other part of that question? Yeah, then I don't understand. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. So no, to translate, you would cert you would so properly one would need to take into account the protons are part of a bound state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, this is all um, physics which is happening at very short distance scales and high energies, in particular, high energy compared to the binding energy in a nucleus. So to a pretty good approximation, uh, you can treat the fact that it's in a nuclear bound state as not particularly relevant and just do this calculation. Now, prop now yeah. theoretically properly, you need to take into account it doesn't make much difference because the energy scales are quite separated. Okay, so what kind of bounds can you get from this kind of thing? So there are about five times 10 to the four tons of water in one of these neutrino detectors. Like, for example, the best bounds come from Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. And this is around uh, something silly big, three times 10 to the minor, three times 10 to the 34 nucleons in this tank. So if we watch it for a period of order years or so, and if we're sensitive to any one of them decaying, we'll get a bound on the lifetime of this thing, which is the lifetime has to be greater than of order this many years. And the actual bound is pretty close to that. The bound is greater than of order 2 times 10 to the 34 years. So what does this mean for the kind of physics that can give rise to baryon number violation? So, Extremely schematically, just dimensionally here, we've got that the rate of proton decay 
It's going to depend on 1 over lambda to the 4 here. And then the other energy scale we've got in our problem is the mass of the proton. Of course, there are order 1 factors and everything. But dimensionally speaking, it's going to go like that. And if we put in the numbers, then if we take uh, lambda to be this very high energy scale, so more than 10 to the 16 GV, then we get that the lifetime is around the experimental bound. Putting that in. So this is showing us how even just an, energy, an experiment which is operating at standard model energy scales can, by putting a ton of stuff there, and by monitoring extremely precisely, such that we see even one decay among all of the atoms sitting in this tank, you can get uh, sensitivity to new physics at extremely high energy scales. So if we had that, say, these operators in the high energy theory were actually coming from the exchange of some heavy particle, which we're ignoring here because it's so heavy that we can't produce it or whatever, then the lambda that we get is going to be of order the mass of this new particle over its couplings, etc. So we see that we're probing the kind of mass particles that occur in grand unified phase, things at extremely high energy scales. So this is one example of how very precise experiments allow us to try and probe way up in this high mass region and look for different kinds of new physics. OK, so that's one example. Another, which uh, let's start over here again. So another example of very much the same kind of thing is electric dipole moments. But before we talk precisely about those, we need to talk about why these are going to be interesting things to talk about. And the point is another symmetry-based one. At low energies, so below electroweak scale, the standard model is uh, at least at the sort of lowest dimensional level is C and P symmetric. So under charge conjugation and parity, both QCD and QED respect these symmetries. Now, parity symmetry is broken by the fact that the weak interactions have a handedness. The left-handed and right-handed fermions couple differently. Um, but so CP symmetry is less badly broken so it's broken by the phase of the quark mass matrices so the CK matrix which I've seen that you'll have uh, done in the flavor lectures um, seems familiar okay and also the equivalent in the lepton sector the uh, PM and S matrix the neutrino mass matrix but those effects are suppressed by small neutrino masses as well. OK, so all right, well, we've got that uh, CP symmetry is something that only gets broken by effects of the electroweak scale, but that's not necessarily enough in itself. Oh, carry on. Um, well, so this is the point at uh, lowest dimension. The neutrinos just don't couple at all of those things. Their couplings are all higher dimensional. So if we write down a, so if we write down a low energy standard model process, then we've got that uh, the electrons and quarks interact through photon, through gluons, etc. But neutrinos will interact through processes which will be, in this theory, things like uh, 
so this will be quark quark or whatever, dimension six operators. So they'll be suppressed. They'll have something which is suppressed by one over the electroweak scale squared. The point is simply that the things which violate CMP are suppressed by um, the electroweak scale. Yes, exactly. They don't interact except through these things. Okay, so this is fine, but uh, it's actually, we, by looking at CP symmetry, we get an even more drastic suppression. So if we want to look at effects in the low energy theory, which violates CP, say we have some uh, say we have some four quark operator or whatever, which we're going to want to be CP violating, then we need two things. We need both that, well, the, all three quark generations participate in whatever the expanded version of this diagram is, because the CKM matrix on only two generations doesn't actually have any complex phase. In order to have the complex phase be meaningful, you need all three generations to participate. So we'd need this diagram to be something along the lines of we have, say, some loop here. Say this is, I don't know, uh, like strange down or whatever. And then in the loop, we have to sum over all the possible uptype quarks that can run through the loop. And because we need to do that, we need to incorporate the off-diagonal CKM matrix terms which are small. So the CKM matrix is, has got mostly diagonal with small terms off the diagonal. So suppressed by, so CP suppressed by so both the off diagonal CKM mixing terms And also the fact that if it were the case that you had any quark mass degeneracies, say the up was the same mass as the charm, or the down was the same mass as the strange, or whatever, then you'd again have a symmetry which you could use to redefine your fields, take away some of the freedom from the CKM matrix, and leave yourself with no physical phase, so no CP violation. So uh, small quark mass splittings. So the fact that uh, like m up squared minus m charm squared and m down squared minus m strange squared are much, much more than the electroweak scale. So taking all this into account, what we get is that the coefficient for this kind of operator, the CP violating part of it, is 1 over electroweak scale squared as it has to be, but with some small numerical parameters up here, which come from the smallness of the Kwakikawas, the off-diagonal CKM matrix terms, etc. And this is useful because, sorry, let's, uh, let's say we're going to try and look for new physics, which is going to introduce some CP violation beyond the standard model. Then that could also give if it's heavy, it'll also give high dimensional operators. And the effect of those will be 1 over new physics scale squared. But if it doesn't have these special symmetry properties, which are suppressing the CP violation from the standard model source, from the CKM phases, then this number, the coefficient on top of this, could be order 1, or at least order 1 over 4 pi, or whatever. So you stand the chance of even if the new physics scale is significantly higher than the electroweak scale, the new physics CP violation competed strongly competing with the standard model because of this small factor. Okay, so coming to electric dipole moments now, the uh, reason to look at them 
is that they are pretty much the simplest CP violating observable. So just a sort of reminder, what is an electric dipole moment? So we look at the interaction of a uh, photon with some Dirac fermion. Then we can write the amplitude. We can expand the amplitude for this. So this is whatever the amplitude is once you take into account all the things that can be happening inside here. Then you've got the usual. So this is just we take. We've got a term that looks like the usual coupling, which is basically the charge of this thing. We've got a term which is going to give us a magnetic dipole moment, which for a direct, simple Dirac fermion we can calculate. So this is what's generally called F2. But then we also have another term, which just by the Lorentz structure we can always put in there, which has an epsilon in it. So details, not particularly important, but we get some extra term which is allowed and can have some other coefficient. And this is going to turn out to be the electric dipole moment of our how I think. So, okay, at low energies, what this gives us is some interaction. Let's say uh, we're going to a situation where our fermion is normal relativistic. We get an interaction which is what you'd expect from electric dipole, we have the external E field dotted with the dipole moment of this thing, which is going to be the magnitude times the spin direction of our fermion. Okay, and by looking at the transformation properties of this, we can see that this is going to be CP violating. So under charge, our electric field, which is sourced by charges and stuff, goes to minus E. The spin of our particle goes to minus s. You can verify just doing the fermion stuff. Under parity, our electric field is a vector, so it also goes to minus e. But our spin is a pseudo vector, so it goes to s. So our interaction term is invariant under charge conjugation. Uh, non it changes sign under parity, so it's a CP violating interaction. And what that means is, as we discussed over here, any contributions in the standard model are going to be extremely suppressed. If we take the electron EDM as an example, both because that's very easy to do measurements on, and because it also has to talk to the quarks in order to feel uh, any CP violation. So in standard model, so EDM at four loops, it only comes in at four loops. You need to connect to the quarks, which need to have some loop diagram to give you things there. And the value that you get is 10 to the minus 27 Oops, sorry, let's just check that. That sounds a bit wrong. Yeah, no, that's correct. Good. It's 10 to the minus 27 times the Bohr magneton, which is the natural sort of value. So this is the value of this, the parametric value of the electron's magnetic dipole moment. So the electric dipole moment is 10 to the 27 times smaller than parametrically it could be. And the units that all the experimentalists in this field like to use, this is 10 to the minus 38 electron charge times centimeters. So if you imagine the electron having some tiny deviation from being spherical, like it's got a bit more negative charge on one side, positive charge on the other, that deviation is 10 to the minus 38 centimeters big. It's incredibly tiny. OK, so the standard model contribution is very small. How big could a contribution from some new physics be? So if we just write down sort of dimensionally the most naive thing we can, so we have some heavy particle which is going to couple to the electron. 
and this is going to have some CP violating phase contributing to the loop where we're not going to worry about where this comes from. Yeah. Um, I am not, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know the, I have not gone through the details of that, so I don't want to give an answer based on no more knowledge than uh, you, but, yeah, you'd need to worry a bit about um, what you mean by things there. I mean, you had some strong coupling set up and whether or not this kind of thing is, the, is a sensible quantity to evaluate, uh, you need to think about. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um, so, I don't, um, so for in a theory where, so these are, we're looking at this for electric charges, okay? So we're not, we're not in any kind of strong coupling situation, we've got magnetic monopoles, nothing like that. This is for electric charges, everything is nice and normal and weakly coupled. Um, I would expect that you shouldn't get some kind of hierarchy there. Once you introduce the monopoles into the system, then something weird might happen. Anyway, no. Basically, I, I don't quite know what the correct formulation of that question is either. So, yeah. Anyway, okay. So... So we have our generic new physics here, which we're just taking to be introducing some kind of CP violation parameterized by some phase phi. Then the magnitude of the uh, CP of the electric dipole moment we get from this loop, we can just get from dimensional analysis. So the parametric thing will be the Bohr magneton. So this is expanding out is electron charge over twice the mass of the electron. So we've got the coupling of whatever this new thing is to the electron, some kind of pi's thing here. We've got to be suppressed by 1 over mx uh, squared from the propagator. So dimensionalizing that, we've got some 1 over mx squared there. And then we've got to depend on the imaginary part, so the sign of whatever this CP violating phase is. Okay, so if we just put in uh, audible numbers for all of these things, then if we have new physics around a TV, we find that on loop, unsuppressed uh, electric dipole moment for electron, assuming some order one CP violating phase, will be uh, much, much larger. So in the units that experimenters like using, 4 times 10 to the minus 26 ECM, so much, much larger than the standard model contribution. So this is telling us that if you can push sensitivity down, then you'll potentially see new physics at uh, plausible scales well before the standard model will come in and make things more difficult to disentangle. Okay, so what uh, have people actually achieved experimentally? So the best, bound, best current bounds on the electric dipole moment of the electron come from something called the ACME experiment. And this places the bound that the magnitude of this thing has got to be less than of order 10 to the minus 29 ECM. So putting that back in uh, mu b units, that's uh, around 2 times 10 to the minus 15 of UB. So this is telling us that we've measured the electron to be, have no deviation from uh, CP violating to an extremely good precision here. 
and in particular, a precision which, though it's not near the standard model value, is in the regime where you're probing interesting scales for potential new physics. Okay, so the experiment itself is, of course, a very complicated thing, but schematically, how do they actually do that? So, and this is quite a nice, neat experiment. It illustrates a few themes that uh, are important in actually trying to build experiments that will work and won't be completely dominated by uh, systematics and things. Okay, so the first theme is that we need to make our effect as large as possible. The most naive thing you might try and do, so we have, remember, our interaction Hamiltonian, which is our electron spin direction dotted with the external E field. So the most naive thing you might try and do is make a sort of big capacitor in a lab or whatever, set up a big E field, and run some electrons through it or whatever. However, the E fields you get in a lab are most of order. So your E, you can set up, if you're doing pretty well, around sort of megavolts per meter before bad things happen, like your air starts to ionize and lightning bolts start flying and everything goes to hell. So to get around that, what they do is they use electrons in polar molecules. In particular, the molecule they use is thorium oxide, but that's somewhat irrelevant. So we have one of our atoms here, another atom here. This one is positive. This one's negative. So an electron, which has got some orbital cloud, which is around the molecule, will see some effective electric field from the nuclei, which is of order atomic strength. So parametrically, the effective E field it'll feel is of order kV squared. That's the sort of length scale that uh, is relevant to the molecule. And in normal units, that's about 100 uh, gigavolts per centimeter. So it's many orders of magnitude bigger than the largest E field you can sensibly make over a decent scale in the lab before all your equipment starts frying and going to hell. So first thing, we want our uh, effect to be as big as possible, so we want to make our uh, thing, uh, the thing that's controlling it, here the external E field, as big as possible. Okay, so then, but what are we actually going to do to measure this effect? So, just like a spin in a magnetic field, if we put some spin perpendicular to our external electric field, then what it will do is it will precess. And in particular, the rate of change of its angle will be equal to the E dot E times dA. Plus or minus, depending on uh, which direction we go, which direction the E field is in. So, what, you, what ideally we do is we'd have our molecule, and we'd set up our electron spin perpendicular to the effective E field, and then try and look for its precession. Now, in terms of actually trying to measure, say, the magnetic field of the electron shifting a bit that would be hellishly hard. Uh, trying to measure the sort of large scale effect on this will be very difficult. So what you want to do is you want to do some kind of um, interference experiment. You want to do some experiment where you're effectively preparing them in one state and then measuring how much they've changed from that state later. So physically what happens is we use some kind of uh, laser setup to polarize all of the electron spins in this direction. We wait a while, and then if they have an EDM, they'll have moved round a bit, so they're now in this direction. And now if we apply the same laser field again, we'll get a different response than if they'd all stayed in the same direction. Now, even that is... Um, going to be prone to all kinds of systematics. So what we want to do is have something we can easily uh, change about the experiment while keeping all the other surrounding things in the lab, et cetera, the same, um, and that will change the size of our effect. So we can look for some small change 
over some backgrounds that we're not going to be able to control very well. So what we can do is, if we have all this within our box, and we've got all our experimental apparatus, complicated stuff around here, this is going to give various magnetic fields, various whatevers, that uh, are going to cause the electron spin to process as well as the effect we're looking for. We have uh, two handles on this. We can change both the direction of the spin we started in, and we can change whether we're making the molecules go in this direction or in the direction, so electric field, this way or this way. And both of those things can be done just by basically hitting them with lasers of various kinds. So we can flip the, si the sign of our effect while keeping all of the rest of the apparatus and hopefully all the extraneous magnetic fields, et cetera, et cetera, um, pretty much the same. Okay, let's assume that we've done our experiment and uh, we've kept all of the nasty noise to a minimum. How good a measurement can we actually hope to get from this kind of thing? So let's calculate this. We have our DE. Let's say we're at the experimental limit that they get, which is 10 to the minus 29 ECM or so. And we had our effective E field, which was our 100 uh, gigavolts per centimeter or so. At this limit, DE times the effective E field is minus 18 EV. So even with this very large E field, this corresponds to an extremely tiny energy splitting between our upspin and our downspin. So if we let the molecules go for some amount of time, so let's say that we take what they actually do in the experiment is a millisecond, and that implies that the phase change we get, which is T times DE times E effective, multiplying all these things together comes out to be about 10 to the minus 6. So even with all this, we only have a very small uh, phase change, so a very small difference from the initial spin state we started it in. Okay, but while you obviously couldn't measure this with one electron, it's almost certainly just uh, going to be measured to be in the same state that it started in. If you have the same experiment done on many, many molecules, then in the usual way, the error on the phase that you can measure goes as 1 over the square root of the number that you do. Yeah. Uh, what's the main reason they can't wait so long? Um, so this is basically time of flight across their apparatus. So you're making these molecules quite cold. This is certainly uh, a lot slower than the usual things you get from some kind of hot source. But you can't, uh, so far, in these kind of experiments, they can't keep them like static in a trap. These things in some beam, which is moving across the thing and uh, has some travel time, which is of order milliseconds or so. Various people are looking at trying to do EDM experiments with molecules uh, or atoms or whatever actually within some kind of uh, static system, either some kind of optical trap or some kind of solid matrix where they're very uh, insulated from uh, all kinds of disturbances. But you, really, you want as few disturbances as possible, and ideally, that is when something is freely sailing through space, not talking to anything else. But if you have that, it only sails across for a certain amount of time before it hits the other wall. So that's what's driving that here. More is, of course, better. OK, so if we were going to try and detect this kind of thing, then purely through systematic error, we'd need to send 10, at least 10 to the 12 molecules through. Uh, and the actual flux in this thing is about uh, 10 to the 13 molecules per second. So they're not limited uh, most strongly by this kind of statistics. So one thing this is telling you is that unlike in the case of, say, the nucleon decays we were talking about earlier, where it was literally how many nuclei can you cram into your detector, we can't sort of win by doing clever things other than building an even bigger detector, which they are doing, of course. Here, we see that the numbers are such that there's no fundamental reason why we can't just either spend more time or send more molecules through or whatever. It's telling us that, sort of fundamentally, there is quite a lot of headroom here if we do experiments in a more clever way uh, such that the systematics don't 
come in and stop us from getting that improvement. And indeed, uh, these, uh, these people and the sort of competing experiments hope that within the next sort of decade or so, they will have brought this bound down by quite a few orders of magnitude, sort of depends how optimistic they're feeling when you ask them, but four or five-ish, maybe. So this is, yeah, and we can see why that is on some level just from doing this kind of very rough calculation. We're not hitting the sort of physical bounds of how many molecules, how much time, whatever. There's still a lot of improvement which is there if you can use it cleverly enough. Okay. So that is a... Uh... Oh, yeah, actually, one other comment to make on uh, EDMs. There's also, in the standard model, another potential source of CP violation other than the CKM phase, the uh, strong CP term, which I don't know if it's been introduced in the lectures yet. It should be in the BSM lectures at some point. Everyone's heard of strong CP? Okay, so the QCD theta term. Um, and things like neutron EDM measurements are especially interesting in that they allow you to probe um, what that, the, how small that term is. So there's certainly lots of other things to be said on EDM experiments, um, which will have to wait till you going and looking at a review or something. Anyway, okay. So then the other thing I want to talk about in terms of looking for high scale new physics is a neutrino, so neutrinoless double beta decay. Yes. Uh, even, so even with things at the level they're at, oh, actually, yes, sorry, I should say at this point. Um, so if you take the, like, the naive one-loop kind of calculation here, we saw that for a TV uh, mediator here, then we had an electric dipole moment which was significantly larger than the experimental limit. So if you put in uh, the actual bound, then in the one-loop model, the scale of the new states should be larger than about 30 TV. So in things with no protection at all from CP violation, you're already probing quite a large range of, say, supersymmetric like models which are focused on hierarchy problem kind of things. Um, what you'll do by going beyond that is probing ones which have, which have some structure which suppresses it, say that it's uh, suppressing the angle there or it comes in at more higher loops or whatever, but if you take it to another few orders of magnitude, you'll make it an even more stringent problem for all of the theories which postulate new physics somewhere near the electroweak scale. This lambda will go up to uh, like 10 to the sort of three or whatever TV or something. And you're going, you'll need to build in um, more protection in order to not uh, get to these bounds. At, there's also, as well as um, like SUSY models or composite models, et cetera, the electroweak scale, um, there are, I think, some models where this was talking about CKM phases here, but you also have some input from the PM and S phases, if the neutrino mass or whatever. So some models of neutrino mass are also probed by improving um, the limits here. Yeah. So how is this people going to do that? Like the overall thing is uncharged, right? It's a molecule. No, no, this is the molecule. The whole molecule goes through, but and the electron is an electron within the molecule. Sorry, if that wasn't clear. So yeah, we're sending the, we're sending the whole molecule through, which is a good thing because the molecule is overall neutral and rejects all kinds of disturbances that a charged particle would. So the whole molecule goes through, and we've polarized one electron within that molecule. So we've tuned some laser to be at the energy splitting such that it flips it to the correct thing. But we're just sending a beam of cold thorium oxide molecules through our experiment. And again, it's this thing that you want it to be insensitive to disturbances in order that you don't get lots of sorts of error, but that also means that uh, it's harder to control.
So any, any other questions on uh, any of the topics so far? Okay, well, so then on to uh, the last topic for today, which will be neutrino less double laser decay. And this is basically coming from the question of neutrino masses. As I'm sure you uh, learned from neutrino lectures, we don't know what the form of the neutrino mass is within the standard model. So at first, people thought the neutrinos were massless, uh, in which case it's just a massless spin half particle. We have one state, which is our neutrino, and it's left-handed. The spin has a particular relation to the momentum direction, and then the anti-neutrino, right-handed, spin the opposite relation. So in that case, everything is simple. But then there was the discovery of neutrino oscillations. And that means that the interaction eigenstates in which they're produced have to be different from the propagation eigenstates in order for the oscillation to happen. So we need some kind of non-diagonal mass matrix, the PM and S matrix. Okay. Now, the problem is, so like for normal particles, like an electron or whatever, we can sort of probe them, everything's fine. Neutrinos, the masses are very small. So from cosmology bounds, the sum of the masses of all three uh, mass eigenstates is less than around 0.1 eV. And because neutri basically because neutrinos have uh, interactions which grow in strength as you go to higher energies below the electroweak scale, we only really see the effects of neutrinos which are at MeV energies and above. So they're always extremely relativistic. And that means it's rather hard to tell the differences between different forms of neutrino mass that we're going to go over. OK, so so the possible mass terms we could write down for a neutrino or for any uh, fermion are Majorana mass terms in two component notation. This would just be so some mass and then the spinner times itself. Or we can have Dirac mass terms where we have, let's write this as M, where we have the left handed neutrino coupling some other species, some other spinner. So we introduce new states. Now, in general, we could have that the uh, mass, let's say that we've got our um, introducing some new states, the right-handed neutrinos, then we can have mass terms both of Majorana form and schematically Dirac, and Dirac form for these kind of things. So, it could be that the neutrinos are purely Dirac. So we have no Majorana mass terms. So then we just have our Dirac mass terms. It would be like the electron, quarks, whatever in the standard model. So in that case, we then have four states. We'd have our spin states for the uh, have our usual things. So we'd have a neutrino, we'd have an antineutrino, and whatever. But we'd also have the other spin state for the neutrino and the other spin state for the antineutrino. So we'd have four states in exactly the same way as we have for electrons and positrons. We've got electrons spin one direction, electrons spin another direction, positrons spin one direction, and positrons spin another direction. Now, OK, we've got four states here, so can't we tell the difference between that and two states? The problem is not very easily at all because these two, because the weak interactions basic, only interact with the left-handed part. So if the neutrino is very relativistic, then these parts are the ones that actually interact with things, whereas these parts 
hardly interact at all up to corrections suppressed by the small neutrino masses. So it's very hard to see the effects of these things if we're only dealing with very relativistic neutrinos. Okay. Now, it's also possible, of course, that we just have um, Majorana masses. Or the other point is that this is somewhat on the side, but if you have a hierarchy in this matrix such that uh, your left-handed mass is small, you have some Dirac mass, and you have some very large mass for the new states, then diagonalizing this, we get uh, a heavy neutrino, which has mass of order this very large mass, and then we get the light states, which have a mass set by the right mass squared over the mass of this thing. So if you set, say, this to be weak scale, which you can get by writing uh, theories with interactions with the Higgs, so and then you set this mass scale, the high thing, this to be some high scale, such as 10 to the 12 GeV or so, then the light mass scale you get out here is the appropriate one for the neutrino masses, kind of neutrino masses we see evidence for. So in this kind of theory where the, you can get the light neutrino masses coming out as coming from heavy physics giving you a scale suppression, then the light neutrinos will just be ignoring the, uh, integrating out the heavy stuff, have looked like they have a purely Majorana mass at low energies. Okay, so we have these two things and because of the fact that we only see very relativistic neutrinos, it's very hard to tell the difference. Just an illustration of that. You could think of a number of ways in which, okay, how can we tell what's going on here? Can we just try and look at slow neutrinos? For example, the cosmic neutrino background, which is left over from the Big Bang in the same way that the CMB is the photons, which were thermalized in the early universe. These will be, if the, given the masses which we see, some of them are probably non-relativistic in galaxies today. And the uh, interactions you get with them will depend on whether they're Majorana or Dirac. However, seeing the cosmic neutrino background is an extremely difficult problem in itself. You generally require sort of football field size worth of detectors, all perfectly instrumented, it's an extremely hard problem. So trying to see slow neutrinos, even in itself, is extremely difficult. You can ask, okay, well, can we just try and see the uh, effects of producing these things in the early universe, even if we can't detect them now? So if we write down our high energies, we can get a Dirac mass term from some coupling to the Higgs. So we've got our say electron, we've got our right-handed neutrino, and we've got the Higgs. So in the early universe, you'll get collisions like this, which will produce the right-handed neutrino. Are these kind of things enough to actually get you anywhere? Basic answer is no. If we write it like this, then our mass is going to be lambda times uh, the electroweak scale and we need lambda less than of order 10 to the minus 12 in order to get the correct neutrino mass scale. And this number is small enough that when you plug things in, you never produce anywhere near like the right number of these in order to actually see them. So these kind of approaches are extremely difficult and not gonna get you very far. As before, one of the best ways to try and look for the difference here is to ask what kind of symmetries are different between these two cases, and what kind of standard model process can we find that will, ha that will not occur in one case, but will occur in another? And the obvious point is that Majorana masses violate lepton number, we have lepton-anti-lepton, -lepton, whereas Dirac mass 
terms don't. They lead to lepton number conservation. So, in the same way that we were looking for baryon number violation earlier through proton decay, in the Yoshino case, we're looking for lepton number non-conservation through decay processes. And the one that turns out to be best for this is this double beta decay. So beta decay is when a neutron decays. So double beta decay is when two neutrons decay. The neutron is uh, our up, down, down. We got our up, down, down. Now, the weak process, so we have some W minus boson, and this gives us our electron. This is going to give us our proton here. So we get an electron proton the usual way, and we have a neutrino. We do the same for the other one. Get an electron out here. Now, usually, in a double beta decay, both of these neutrinos from this one and this one will just go flying out into the universe as well. So we get so double beta would be, so neutron, neutron goes to proton, proton, E minus, E minus, nu, nu. But here, if we have a Majorana mass term, which takes two left-handed neutrinos and connects them, then these two can, as we're writing out diagrammatically, annihilate each other. We can write down a diagram such that we only get the two electrons out. So, um, okay, what's the rate of this going to be, very roughly? So, extremely schematically, we've got two powers of, uh, we've got two electroweak bosons here, so we've got G Fermi to the fourth here. We've got a term which has got to go like the Majorana mass of the neutrino squared. And then, dimensionally, we've got to have some energy to the power 7 here. So this energy scale is going to be of order MeV, because that's what uh, the energy difference here is. Obviously, it's going to depend rather sensitively on actually getting the numbers right here. But if we just plug all this in, we get that this is 1 over 10 to the 31 years if we make this of order typical neutrino mass scale and we make this of order so actual calculations you get for this kind of neutrino mass scale about 1 over 10 to the 28 years we shouldn't be surprised by a sort of few orders of magnitude difference here because we have large powers hanging around but schematically this is sort of showing you where the uh, scale is coming from so we've got something that is a very, very long time, but as the example of proton decay illustrated, isn't necessarily hopeless. There we were getting like bounds of 10 to the 34 years or so. So putting in actual numbers, we need that, whereas before they were looking at thousands of tons for proton decay, here we're a few orders of magnitude better, so we need sort of ton scale samples in order to have this happen like a few times, see in year time, and if we have that, this will happen a few times within the lifetime of our experiment. Now, of course, unlike proton decay, where pretty much nothing looks like a proton decaying, here we have another process which looks almost exactly like it, except for some neutrinos. But we don't see the neutrinos. So how do we tell that this has happened? So we see a proton a proton and two electrons versus a proton, 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 electron, electron, and two neutrinos. What we need to do is use the fact that the electron, the neutrinos, have taken away some energy. So if we look at the energy of the two electrons that we get, and this is like the number that we see, for the double beta decay process, we're going to get some... Uh, thing which has some distribution set by the phase space, et cetera, and 
cuts off uh, whatever the energy difference is minus neutrino mass scale. With this process, what you're going to get on top of that is you don't have the neutrinos taking the energy away. The electrons take all of the energy away. So you're going to have some small bump. This is exaggerated, of course. What you actually get is something that's much, much smaller and only just peaks out above. You get some small bump at the end of the energy spectrum. So this is telling you that you're going to need extremely good energy resolution in these things. You're not only going to have to see all of these things with almost no background, you're going to have to see them and measure the energy of each electron exquisitely precisely in order to tell that you have a tiny bump on top of this tail, which has many, many more events in overall. So that is challenging, but something that is currently being pursued very, very sort of uh, aggressively, and for some models with neutrino masses in the white range, might actually be able to see stuff within the next sort of, uh, certainly the next decade or so. Yeah. So the, because there are no neutrinos, exactly. So if we look at um, the case with neutrinos, so what we've got is we've got our nucleus, and it goes to, in the beta, double beta decay case, it goes to nucleus, which reacts a little bit. We get two electrons flying away. And we also get two neutrinos flying away. So nu, nu, e, e. So it's most likely that because uh, the energy that's involved is quite large, compared, is decent size compared to the mass of the electron, and certainly large compared to the mass of the neutrino, all of these things take away like roughly the same amount of energy. Whereas in the neutrino dust case, we have our nucleus, and we get the nucleus recoiling a little bit, and the two electrons taking away all of the energy. So in this case, the electrons are going to have most of, like half of the energy goes into neutrinos most of the time. Here, all, pretty much all of the energy goes into the electrons all of the time. So we get a situation where we have almost all of the energy going into, well, all of the energy going into the electrons. And whereas here, that's an unlikely thing to happen just through phase space reasons. So we get a tiny bump. That's the idea. So, yeah, so we're not, so we're not there yet in terms of probing uh, realistic models, but we will be. One slightly uh, pessimistic note is that this parameter m nu here wasn't actually the mass of any given neutrino. This was, so we have some interaction eigenstates here, and this parameter, which is generally called m beta beta, is some appropriate sum of the neutrino masses and the mixing angles and phases in the uh, PMNS matrix. So it's possible uh, in certain configurations of that matrix that this parameter, there could be cancellations, that m beta beta could be small, even if the neutrino masses are whatever their value is. So, Uh, it would be tuned, yes. But so, well, if you've heard the phrase as normal hierarchy and inverted hierarchy in the neutrino lectures, then in the inverted hierarchy, it is such that you can't get the cancellations working out. In the normal hierarchy, it can be small. So, yeah, but this, isn't, this is something that the, it would just have to be unlucky. But you can be a bit unlucky, and that can make it much harder to see it. And then, on a more optimistic note, even if you did see this kind of thing, there's the question of, okay, we've seen this, is this actually due to neutrino masses? All we've seen is that uh, we get some process where this is happening, but there are other lepton number violating things that could happen. We could put heavy states in here instead, and can we tell the difference? One thing that makes that somewhat less worrying is that the neutrino mass operator is the lowest dimension thing one can add to the standard model. So if you add a, Meyer, some, a term which is lepton Higgs, lepton Higgs, suppressed by only one power of some new scale, that gives you your Majorana masses. Higher operators which violate the lepton number in a different way are going to be higher dimensional. So they're going to be suppressed by more powers of whatever the new physics scale is. So in order to get decent sized rates, 
for this kind of thing. So if we have some higher dimensional operator, which gives us a leptin number violation, that means that lambda new physics should be of order few TV in order to actually get something of the right rate because we're getting more powers of it when we actually work out the uh, decay rate. And in that case, you can hope that there would be some new physics around the TV scale or whatever, which you'd see in, in, or along with this at the LHC or other experiments. So, yeah, probably about the time to finish up on that and take any other questions. But the sort of general theme throughout this lecture has been how can we look for the influence of, of new physics, which is at higher energy scales than we can probe directly through just banging stuff together by looking at the effects on standard model processes at much lower energies. One of the best ways to do that, and a theme running through all of these things, is try and find some kind of symmetry reason why the messy standard model backgrounds that you'd otherwise have go away, and you can look for some clean signal. So um, in the other lectures, we'll go on to more of the uh, low, the light weak couple physics end that I sort of motivated in the first sketchy diagram. But uh, yeah, any other questions? Mass comes from an even higher dimensional operator? Um, well, so if, so yes, yeah, it could be that there's some reason why this doesn't occur. Like, um, I am, well, so for example, if you did have a, say, B minus L symmetry, then you couldn't have that, and Neutrinos would have to be Dirac. So having to be Dirac is a definite reason why this kind of thing wouldn't happen. And their Dirac mass scale can come from various places. In cases where your lepton mass is a Majorana, um, I mean, this is the easiest thing to make work. Uh, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, you could probably construct if you had to. Any, yeah? So if you gauge baryon number, something has gone very wrong. Because like I said in the first part of the lecture, baryon number is violated even within the standard model by Svaleron processes. So you would have, you'd then have an anomalous gauge symmetry. Uh, that doesn't make sense um, on a sort of, if you're actually viewing it as a real symmetry, what it does mean is that your baryon number ve vector, the couples to baryon number, would need to be extremely weakly coupled if it's light, because otherwise you'd have production processes which uh, were of its longitudinal mode, which blew up with higher energy. Now, you can gauge B minus L, because Svela run processes have delta B equals 3, delta L equals minus 3, uh, and things like that. So that is possible. And in that case, yes, you'd be required to have a Dirac neutrino mass, because these kind of things violate B minus L. So, um, yeah, B and L individually, bad because of uh, the anomalous nature of the symmetry. B, B minus L is possible. Although, one, actually, one interesting point about that is that as... Uh, I think Matt Reese has been talking to you about, there are reasons from considerations around quantum gravity to be a bit worried about uh, very weakly coupled forces. And from bounds which we have on uh, forces coupling to matter, a B minus L vector, which was light, would need to be extremely weakly coupled. Otherwise, we'd have seen it already. So um, there are potentially some theoretical reasons there to be like, OK, is that, is that still compatible? But those are of a very different nature than this. Phenomenologically, it could be that. Thanks. Wait a moment. Wait a so what about the electric dipole moments of, uh, say, muon and uh, tau? Is there any uh, experimental bounds um, or any so coming up bounds? I do not know what the bounds there are. They'll be much, much worse than the electron, because obviously you can't do these kind of precision experiments where you're having them hang around for a millisecond or whatever to measure it. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, these bounds will be from various collider type things. I do not know what the, I expect. Okay, I expect they'll be press. They'll correspond to um, things at scales of hundreds of GV or something. Just because if you have extra stuff doing that, then you would see it at very high energy things like LHC. So maybe things like that. Any yeah. any other questions? No, there's a discussion session later as well, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So the uh, little bump at the end comes from the neutrino-less double beta decay, but is there 
so apart from regular beta decay, what is the addition from neutrino full double beta decay do to the, to the spectrum? Um, as in quantitatively, like what's the comparison or maybe I didn't? I mean, is there any more topographical sort of characteristic that it um, so requires? I, so you're asking like if you could measure things like the polarization or whatever, would, this, would there be any difference there or in other observables, is that the question? Maybe, or I mean, does it alter the spectrum at all, the presence of the fact that you can have double beta decay? Oh, I guess actually they're com it's just two beta decays happening at the same time, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay, never mind that. Yeah. No more questions, so it seems so let's uh, thank you. <laughs> okay.